A new longitudinal study finds that higher amounts of protein are linked with healthier aging and reduced odds or risk of developing chronic conditions such as obesity, high blood pressure, memory loss, joint issues, and more. This is a really interesting data set because it was published by folks over at Tufts as well as Harvard. You might recognize some of the names of the authors here. This was just published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. The title of today's study that we're going to talk about is Dietary Protein Intake in Midlife in Relation to Healthy Aging, Results from the Prospective Nurses Health Study Cohort. Now, I would love to say that this study has no healthy user bias and there's no issues with the data, but it's an epidemiological study. And as we've talked about before, epi epidemiological studies have a lot of limitations because they rely upon food frequency questionnaires and have challenges in terms of figuring out the differences in the cohorts of individuals. So the, it turns out that the individuals who ate higher amounts of protein throughout the, the, the study period and the nurse's health study uh, every two years is administering questionnaires about food uh, intakes and amounts of protein, the lifestyle factors and so forth. And they're tracking these subjects over time and trying to figure out any associations with eating patterns and lifestyle behaviors and their, their associations with developing certain chronic conditions such as obesity and, and not uh, having chronic diseases when they get older, which is characterized by healthier aging. And essentially what they found at the end of this data analysis is that protein intake was significantly associated with higher odds of healthy aging. The odds ratio per 3% energy increment with healthy aging were 1.05 for total protein. So this is a very small percent, like 5% greater probability of of aging better if you eat higher amounts of protein compared to lower amounts of protein. And the cohorts, they put people in different buckets based upon their self-reported protein intakes. And so the on the low end, it was about 58 grams per day. On the high end, and again, this is women, on the higher end, it was about 90 grams per day. And so when you're comparing the highest amounts of protein intakes based upon these food frequency questionnaires compared to the lowest amounts, there's a 5% greater odds that you will age more healthfully as you get older if you have higher amounts of protein, closer to say 90 grams per day compared to just 50 grams per day. Now, they went on to stratify and adjust for animal proteins versus plant proteins and more. And I think the nuances here are a little bit uh, interesting. We're gonna talk about that shortly. And they say that the odds ratio for healthy aging is higher when you look at higher amounts of plant-based protein. And the odds ratio here is 1.38. So it's a bit, almost 60% greater odds, they say, of having healthier parameters linked with healthier aging if you have more plant-based protein. But what I think is interesting when you actually look at the uh, how they categorized plant-based protein. So if you look at the materials and methods here, the intakes of total protein and protein from animal, dairy, and plant sources were calculated for each participant by multiplying the consumption frequency of each food item by its protein content and then adding the protein intake across all food items, they say. The intake of other nutrients were estimated using the same procedure. Now, you might be wondering, how are the investigators uh, characterizing animal proteins from plant-based proteins. They say the main contributors to dairy protein, a subset of animal protein, were milk, cheese, pizza, yogurt, and ice cream. So it turns out that if you eat higher amounts of ice cream, that it might be linked with better aging, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And here's what's even more interesting here. They say the main plant-based protein sources were bread, vegetables, fruits, that I didn't know that fruits had protein, but evidently they do. Uh, pizza, cereal, baked items, mashed potatoes, nuts, beans, peanut butter, and pasta. Okay, so I think actually, as, as much as my bias would love to say, see another study finds higher amounts of protein are linked with better aging, I think we have a problem with, again, nutritional epidemiology. And so let's look at table one. We're gonna look at the baseline characteristics of the study participants. As I mentioned, they bucketed people into their protein intakes. You have quintile one, the total protein intake was just 57 grams per day. In contrast to quintile two, there was 9,752 people in this quintile. Uh, these individuals had about 90 grams of protein per day. Now, when you look at the percentage of higher education, master's degree, bachelor's degree, and so forth, it's much higher in quintile five. And so these people are higher, they have more education, they also have lower body mass indexes. And so I think what we're seeing here 
is again, just the healthy user bias. As, as much as my biases would like me to believe that higher amounts of protein are linked with better aging, I do think they are in some contexts, particularly if people are physically active and having an adequate amount of protein to help to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. But we just have another classic issue and a shortcoming linked with nutritional epidemiology where we're comparing people who are healthier compared to people who are unhealthier. Because if we look at smokers, the percentage of individuals who are past or current smokers is much higher in the group that ate lower amounts of protein. So current smokers is about 30% in quintile one that, that ate the least amount of protein compared to just 19% in the group that ate higher amounts of protein. So I think that's quite interesting. But then when you start to stratify this based upon sources of protein, animal protein versus plant-based protein uh, and beyond, you start to see some interesting things here uh, in table two. And this is highlighting the odds ratios of healthy aging assessed based upon protein intake. And they cr created these uh, multivariate models to adjust for different things like body mass index, smoking status, as well as source of protein. And they go down to say that higher amounts of plant-based protein, which again included pizza, bread, pasta, potatoes, I mean, these are things that aren't generally considered to be healthy, uh, were linked with higher odds of healthier aging. Now, when you look at uh, just animal-based proteins, in fact, when you stratify that for all these different, when you adjust that data for body mass index and all these other factors, there's not a negative association or, or uh, increased odds ratio of developing unhealthy aging with higher amounts of animal-based protein. I think that's quite interesting. But again, we have to look at the baseline characteristics here. We're comparing uh, an unhealthy population, higher smoking status, higher body mass index, and so forth, compared to lower body mass index uh, individuals, which I think uh, is quite interesting. So uh, let's go on and talk about the mechanisms. I think these mechanisms are interesting, especially coming from folks over at Tufts and Harvard, and we're gonna talk about blood pressure and inflammation and mechanistic target of rapamycin and all these different mechanisms linked with higher protein intakes. But first, friends, I just wanna say thank you as always for being here. Hopefully you're enjoying this content and this study breakdown. If you are, please hit that like button. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and let me know what you think of these study breakdowns in the comment section below. Now, since we're talking about protein and muscle protein synthesis, I just wanna remind you of another nutrient that may help you with your exercise exercise sessions, and that is creatine. Creatine is a conditionally essential nutrient that helps you with your exercise economy, meaning it helps you get more mileage from your exercise sessions by helping to increase cellular energy while you're working out, particularly doing explosive type movements or resistance training based movements. Creatine helps supply some ATP to your working muscles. Now, creatine also helps with hydration. And that's why over at Myoscience, you get both creatine paired with electrolytes that not only help with cellular hydration, but electrolytes help with the absorption of creatine. There's over 825 reviews on the electrolyte sticks that feature creatine, the Crea Pure creatine monohydrate that's made in Germany, along with magnesium, potassium, you get taurine, you also get real salt in, as the sodium source. So you can check out what other folks are saying over at myoscience.com and save with the code podcast at checkout. And I will link that in the description below. So let's talk about some different mechanisms here explaining the associations with protein intake and healthy aging. So these mechanisms, the investigators say, are complex and not fully understood. Regarding physical function, some lines of evidence suggest that the activation of the mammalian target of rapamycin complex one, that is mTOR C1 signaling pathway, decreases with age. Dietary protein and exercise activate the mTOR C1 signaling pathway, thereby stimulating muscle protein synthesis, which is associated with improvements in physical function in older adults. There are several potential mechanisms that may explain the differential associations between plant and animal protein intake on the chronic disease domain of the healthy aging phenotype. The investigators say plant protein has been associated with favorable levels of important risk factors of cardiometabolic diseases, such as reduced LDL cholesterol, lower blood pressure, and insulin sensitivity, as well as decreased levels of pro-inflammatory markers. Conversely, total and animal protein intakes were positively associated with concentrations of insulin-like growth factor one, which has been implicated in the growth of malignant cells in the breast and prostate tissue. In our study, dietary protein was favorably associated with physical function in older age, and this relationship was stronger, they say, for plant protein intake, despite the fact that the category of plant protein that they're using included pizza, it included pasta and bread. 
Anyway, so this is where the biases come in here. As much as I would love to say this study is just amazing. Again, we looked at the, the categories of food intake and pizza and ice cream were part of the dairy category. And they said that higher amounts of dairy-based protein were linked with healthier aging, but you had ice cream. This is interesting stuff. The investigators say studies of older adult populations have found that protein intake has been associated with decreased lean mass in older age. Animal protein supplementation studies in older adults have been implicated in lean mass gains, which were potentially related to its amino acid composition. However, lean mass gains related to short-term supplementation have been inconsistent with long-term prospective studies, which have observed favorable associations between plant protein intake and frailty, but no associations for animal protein intake. One potential explanation is that plant protein is associated with reduced risk of chronic diseases over a long period of follow-up. So remember, just have more bread, pasta, and pizza, and you will, you will just completely avert all these chronic diseases. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In turn, chronic diseases are associated with reduced physical function and frailty in older adults. Furthermore, these studies have included the incidence of chronic diseases in their definition of frailty, which highlights the role of plant protein given its beneficial associations with the risk of chronic conditions. Okay, I'm just gonna stop right here. There's a lot of different things that they talk about why plant-based protein sources might be superior because they have fiber, macronutrients, poly phenols. Okay, so let's talk about this. When it comes to protein sources, the types of amino acids really matter. And it turns out that if you want to get adequate amino acids that are sufficient to increase muscle protein synthesis, those amino acids need to be in the form of leucine, isoleucine, uh, as well as methionine. You also need other uh, conditionally essential uh, amino acids, glutamine, glycine, other things. The point is, when you're getting a lot of your protein from plants, you're not getting sufficient amounts of essential amino acids that are necessary to stimulate this mTOR C1 complex that helps to um, synthesize muscle, especially in exercised context. Various studies have shown, and we've reviewed these studies over the past several years, that animal-based proteins, whether it's from dairy, whether it's chicken, whether it's eggs, whether it's red meat from ruminants and so forth, are superior at stimulating muscle protein synthesis compared to their plant protein counterparts. Now, the only downside, I, I don't really care what people eat. It's your choice. You can eat whatever you want. But you're going to have to eat higher quantities of plant-based protein to get the same essential amino acids to stimulate these important uh, kinases and enzymatic pathways that stimulate muscle protein synthesis. That's inarguable at this point. And so I'm not really sure why uh, we still have so many academic uh, institutions and the opinion is that it's all about plant protein. Because you know most of the plant protein sources come from soy that is largely genetically modified uh, and is heavily sprayed with Roundup and glyphosate. So you know, there's not a lot of really good plant-based proteins that are free of anti-nutrients, oxalates, things that perturb uh, gastrointestinal function and uh, the absorption of these essential amino acids and beyond. So I think it's interesting that the scientific community is sort of, you know, going back and forth when it comes to protein. Sometimes, you know, you hear folks like Chris Gardner over at Stanford saying, we've, you know, just talked too much about protein and, and Americans are eating way too much protein and all this protein is really problematic. And you had this epidemiological study from, I think it was January of this year, highlighting that protein intake is linked with the increased risk of diabetes. We also had the Stanford twin study that found that, you know, that going on, that randomized twins to either eat an omnivorous diet or whole foods plant-based diet finding that the whole foods plant-based diet in their analysis reduced LDL cholesterol. So therefore it was healthier than the omnivorous diet group, although triglycerides increased and uh, lean body mass changes were not reported. But you know, it's interesting that we're seeing this back and forth. And even in this back and forth tug and pull from the academic institutions, there is still obviously a bias here with little to no reference, especially in this study of the healthy user bias as part of why possibly uh, the folks that self-reported in the food frequency questionnaires reporting higher amounts of protein intake link are linked with healthier aging, despite the fact that these people smoked less, had higher amounts of education, and probably uh, just live healthier lifestyles. I didn't actually look at multivitamin use, but since we're here, let's, let's look at multivitamin use. This is also a, generally a good indicator of the healthy user bias because people that are taking multivitamins are generally more concerned about their health. And so since we are here, 
we're going to look at this. Okay, so the, the multivitamin use percentage, it appears to be statistically significant. The people who ate the lowest amounts of protein, 32% of them took multivitamin compared to 39% of individuals in the highest quintiles of protein intake. And let's look at alcohol consumption and prevalence of hypertension. This is what I think is interesting. Prevalence of hypertension was actually quite low, just 15% in the lowest protein intake group compared to 20% in the folks that reported higher amounts of protein. Alcohol intake was lower. Here's what's interesting. So alcohol intake, again, we're looking at table one here, the baseline characteristics was 9.6%. This is grams per day in individuals in the lowest amount of protein intake compared to the highest amount alcohol intake was 4.1. So they drank about half as much alcohol. So I don't know what to make of this study. If you just want to take it for face value and not dive into anything and just believe what the abstract says, the abstract says dietary protein intake, especially from plants at, in midlife, is associated with higher odds of healthy aging. But if you look at the details, I think we have healthy user bias. I would love to know what your thoughts are after watching this video and possibly downloading and reading this study yourself that I will link in the YouTube description and also on the show notes page. It's interesting stuff. I think it's important that we talk about these things as well as a study uh, methodology and the statistics. So let me know what you think in the comment section below. I appreciate you tuning all the way in. We'll catch you on a future episode down the road.